Hello and welcome to the Realm of Chemicals, Nanotechnology and Key Cases for 2017 webinar. My name is Bailey Reeves and I will be in the background answering any Adobe Connect technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties within the Adobe Connect session, please use the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and our technical assistance team will help in any way possible. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience. However, to maintain privacy, the number and names of attendees will not be displayed. All attendees will be in a listen-only mode throughout the presentation, and as a reminder, today's call is being recorded. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. To submit a question, click on the Q&A panel located on the bottom of your screen. Type your question into the text field and hit send. This seminar is accredited for one hour of Illinois and North Carolina MCLE credit. Please inquire if you wish to seek CLE accreditation in additional states. During the webinar, we will be providing three CLE codes. Please write these down. We will be emailing evaluation forms at the end of the webinar and will ask for the codes. If you have any questions regarding CLE, please contact CLE at BrinkSkillson.com. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce our first presenter for today, Rashad Morgan. Rashad, you now have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Rashad Morgan, and I am a shareholder in our Research Triangle Park office of Brinks, Gilson & Leon. And today I will be giving an overview of the Nanotechnology National Initiative. During today's discussion, I will talk about what the National Nanotechnology Initiative is, the 2016 NNI Strategic Plan, Open Science, Intellectual Property, and the NNI, and also my final thoughts with regards to the topic. So first, what is the National Nanotechnology Initiative, or NNI? The NNI, which was established in 2001, is a U.S. government research and development initiative involving nanotechnology-related activities of 20 departments, and independent agencies. I will note that the NNI was first discussed during uh, the presidency of Bill Clinton. However, it was funded during the presidency of George Bush in 2001. Uh, partners involved with the NNI include the United States Patent and Trademark Office, the Department of Commerce, the FDA, the United States International Trade Commission, as well as NASA. The NNI consists of the individual and cooperative nanotechnology-related activities of federal agencies with a range of research and regulatory roles and responsibilities. According to the supplement to the President's budget for fiscal year 2017, since the inception of the NNI, participating agencies have invested nearly $24 billion in fundamental and applied nanotechnology R&D, technology transfer, world-class characterization, testing, and fabrication facilities, education and workforce development, and efforts directed at understanding and controlling the environmental, health, and safety aspects of nanotechnology. The vision of the NNI is a future in which the ability to understand and control matter at the nanoscale leads to a revolution in technology and industry that benefits society. The NNI is focusing on efforts to continue investment in research while stimulating a transition from fundamental discovery to nanotechnology-based applications. In particular, there is a focus on lab to market. A lab to market is defined or has been explained as taking the innovations in research that are taking place in the labs and different facilities and learning how to commercialize those particular activities. In addition, it involves engaging the broader nanotech community to not only spread the word on the work that is done by the different agencies and different public entities and private entities that are involved in the NNI, uh, but also internationally uh, in those other entities that are focused on advancing nanotechnology. International commercialization efforts of the NNI include exchanging information on topics such as market needs, intellectual property rights, and regulation uh, in order to accompany the rapid pace of global innovation and nanotechnology. 
So as I mentioned with regard to Lab to Market, there is a concerted effort on the part of the NNI and its partners to take these innovations from the lab and commercialize and protect them as they go forward uh, into tangible products. The NNI has four interdependent goals for success. The first goal is advance a world-class nanotechnology research and development program. The second goal is to foster the transfer of new technologies into products and for commercial and public benefit. The third goal is to develop and sustain educational resources, a skilled workforce, and a dynamic infrastructure and tool set to advance nanotechnology. And the fourth goal, support responsible development of nanotechnology. So this leads us to a discussion of the 2016 NNI strategic plan. Under the 21st Century Nanotechnology Research and Development Act of 2003, NNI agencies are required to develop an updated NNI strategic plan every three years. Uh, prior to the 2016 NNI strategic plan, the previous strategic plan was in 2014. The NNI strategic plan provides the overall framework under which individual agencies conduct their own, min own mission. Uh, this means that specific nanotechnology programs, coordination of activities amongst the different agencies, and efforts to collaborate are all put forward in this strategic plan. The strategic plan provides specific objectives in support of the four interdependent goals of the NNI. The 2016 uh, strategic plan in particular provides four to five specific objectives designed to further the four interdependent goals of the NNI. Uh, since the inception of the NNI, those four goals have not changed. However, as this initiative has developed and increased in participation, the objectives to reach those goals have been modified. Examples of the objectives in the NNI strategic plan include, for goal number one, support research and development that extends the frontiers of nanotechnology and strengthens the intersections of scientific disciplines. For goal two, an objective is to increase focus on nanotechnology-based commercialization and related support for private partnerships. And for goal three, establish and sustain programs that assist in developing and maintaining a skilled nanotechnology workforce. The draft 2016 NNI strategic plan was released for public comment on September 12, 2016, and it was closed on September 23, 2016. During that time, uh, 10 comments were submitted in response to the request for public comments. Uh, two highlights from the public comments include a grand new challenge targeted at infant and mother mortality. A grand challenge is defined by the NNI as an ambitious but achievable goal that harnesses nanoscience, nanotechnology, and innovation to solve important national or global problems and has the potential to capture the public's imagination. So one of the things that they received was a new challenge directed at uh, infant and mother mortality. And the second one is open science, which I will discuss a bit more now. So what is open science? Open science refers to the process of making the content and process of producing evidence and claims transparent and accessible to others. Supporters of open science have proposed that federally funded nanotechnology documentation should be open source and freely available to researchers and the public. In addition, it has been proposed that the open exchange of research promotes greater peer review and credibility for the research. So how does the 2016 NNI strategic plan address uh, the needs of those that are seeking open science? So the the strategic plan recognizes that there are dual aims of promoting and protecting nanotechnology. In particular, there is a promotion within the strategic plan to promote the concept of open sharing of research outputs. Uh, the NNI has developed foundational cyber infrastructure for nanotechnology research and development. In addition, uh, there is the NNI collaboration ecosystem. Which is, which is where the agencies of the NNI have adopted mechanisms to share information to serve the needs of the community. 
This ecosystem includes uh, the nanotechnology research and development community, which are grantees, students, companies, technical and professional societies and foundations. There are nanotechnology signature initiatives, which are multi-agency initiatives designed to provide an, an increased emphasis and focus on technology areas of national importance. Some current initiatives include water sustainability through nanotechnology, nanotechnology for sensor and sensors for nanotechnology, sustainable nano manufacturing, nanoelectronics, nanotechnology knowledge and infrastructure. A previous signature initiative included a focus on solar energy. However, at the end of 2015, that was ended due to advancements and accomplishments in that area. The aforementioned grand challenges are also a part of the NAI collaboration ecosystem because it provides an opportunity for public and private interests to work towards a greater goal. Uh, the NNI also supports contests and community networks for the exchange of informa information. And there are communities of research. Uh, one in particular is the United States and European Union community of research, uh, which provides a platform for American and European researchers to share information and collaborate across national boundaries. So there are efforts by the NNI to make the research and the work done in this initiative open and shareable amongst those that have an interest uh, in these advances. The strategic plan, however, also addresses the need for protection of intellectual property in order to enable innovation, commercialization, and trade. Uh, one particular agency that I mentioned earlier that is involved is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, the Patent and Trademark Office contributes a variety of nanotechnology-related patent data that is used as a benchmark to analyze nanotechnology development and for trend analysis of nanotechnology patenting activity in the United States and globally. Uh, one key decision by the USPTO that has helped advance the NNI was an adoption of the definition of nanotechnology and its development of the first detailed patent-related nanotechnology classification hierarchy of any major intellectual property office in the world, uh, which has enabled the examiners to get a better understanding of what nanotechnology is and also increases their expertise in that area. So the 2006 strategic plan seeks to engage the international community in both of these concepts. Uh, so there is a balance uh, between both of these aims, but the strategic plan uh, comes up with ways so that both communities are fulfilled in what they want to do. So some final thoughts. The 2016 NNI strategic plan establishes that collaboration and partnerships are a key aspect of the NNI and the U.S. innovation ecosystem. Patents filed and granted will be one of the key measures determining the success of the NNI. And the NNI recognizes that strong patent protections help to promote the goals of the NNI, strengthen the economy, and further nanotechnology innovation. Uh, the NNI has been supported by previous administrations. Uh, while there hasn't been much said about the NNI with the current administration, uh, there is a belief that the efforts of the NNI will continue on. Uh, so with that, I conclude my part of the presentation, and the next presenter is Aisha Hassan. Thanks, Rashad. Hello, everybody. I'm Aisha Hassan, and I'm an associate here at Brink Skilson in the Research Triangle Park, North Carolina office. And my uh, portion of this webinar is going to focus on protection of nanotechnology inventions. So where Rashad left off on uh, open source uh, and sharing, um, my talk is going to focus sort of on the opposite end of that, which is the actual uh, protection and obtaining intellectual property. All right, so uh, a discussion of protecting nanotech inventions has to begin with a discussion of the nanotechnology patent thicket. What is the nanotechnology patent thicket to begin with? Um, the textbook definition of a patent thicket is that it results when too many owners hold overlapping intellectual property patents. 
Now that's kind of a very vague definition, uh, but since a picture is worth a thousand words, I thought that this graphic might actually help illustrate what that means. Um, this graphic describes the U.S. patent thicket for nanomaterial technology, and it describes the overlapping nature of the thicket. And if you look at the graph, um, across the top you'll see the various nanomaterials, um, and um, across the left-hand side you'll see the various sectors. And, and essentially what this graphic is trying to show you that patents that exist in a particular sector for a particular type of nanomaterial can have various degrees of overlap. Uh, so for example, if you look at um, nanowires in the healthcare and cosmetics sector, there's not a whole lot of overlap in those particular patents in that sector. Whereas if you look at, for example, fullerenes in the energy sector, um, there's almost 50% of those patents are, are overlapping each other. And so when you have this uh, extensive overlapping uh, for all the patents that exist in that space, there's this incredibly complicated interconnectivity that essentially is difficult to navigate. Now why was the patent thicket formed? Um, it's important to understand why it was formed so you can navigate the thicket. Um, and a lot of the reasons that the patent thicket was formed in the first place are really just the result of the evolution of nanotech as a science and how the scientific concepts of nanotech uh, actually unfolded. The first thing that happened um, as nanotech was introduced as a science really to the public was that there was this phenomenon called a patent land grab. And what that meant was that the early players in nanotechnology such as universities, research centers, and companies that were all in the early stages of nanotech, they all made this incredible rush to try to get a stake in the ground in terms of protecting their IP. And that essentially resulted in the PTO being overwhelmed with uh, a large amount of applications for this very new science, and then dealing with the challenges of trying to examine all these applications. So in essence, there was probably a phenomenon of over-patenting that existed. Um, the second thing that happened was because nanotechnology is one of the only fields in which fundamental concepts were actually patented, this resulted in what we call the formation of these building block patents. These patents cover very basic scientific phenomena, and in many cases these patents have very, very broad claims. Now they don't necessarily have commercial value of their own, but a lot of times they are needed for downstream production of a commercial product. So for example, if I'm doing research exploring the antimicrobial properties of silver nanocrystals, even if I've developed my own method of making those silver nanocrystals, I need to make sure there is a patent out there that covers the nanocrystals themselves, and I need to make sure that I'm not infringing it. So in many situations, these building block patents are actually a deterrent for uh, a lot of entities um, from moving forward with innovation. Again, because this was a fairly new field, uh, as the initial wave of applications came in, uh, there was some inconsistent use of terminology. Remember, applicants are their own lexicographers, and um, it was turning out that some, sometimes different applicants were trying to refer to the same thing by different terms. So for example, uh, one set of applications might refer to something as a nanotube, and another set of applications could refer to something as a nanofiber. Uh, well, they were both trying to describe the same things, but because no terms of art had really been uh, created at that point, uh, examiners were struggling with dealing with this inconsistent terminology, and that, of course, affected examination. Uh, like I said earlier, this was a, a new science, and so uh, the patent examiners themselves were dealing with sort of a lack of training on how to uh, deal with this particular uh, technology. Uh, as Rashad mentioned, the, the NNI definition of nanotech has since been adopted by the USPTO, and the USPTO has also, of course, developed a patent classification system since then. But when those things weren't available, uh, and this was, like I said, a new science, these examiners were struggling to deal with uh, uh, examining these new technologies. There was also a phenomenon of concealment early on as well. 
And this is just the situation where applicants were uh, deliberately being ambiguous in describing their inventions in order to uh, avoid discovery of relevant prior art. But I think the, one of the biggest factors about nanotechnology that contributed to the patent thicket was just the very cross-disciplinary nature of nanotech. Remember, basic nanotech inventions can be involved in a variety of uh, technologies. Semiconductor design, biotech, material science, telecommunications. Even though the actual patent might be held by a firm that operates in a completely different space, so sometimes the majority of the technology that was being captured in these applications was actually in a field other than nanotech. And that made it very difficult for examiners to do prior art searching as well. All right, so we know this, this patent thicket sort of evolved as nanotech was unfolding. So what were the legal implications of the thicket? Uh, first of all, because of the complexity and the interrelatedness of these patents, it made it difficult for um, inventors to commercialize their inventions. Sometimes it's difficult to not only determine the scope of protection, but sometimes it was also difficult to determine who the owners of the IP were. In addition, uh, enforcement was also difficult because it's difficult to determine what the boundaries are that could potentially lead to infringement. And in many situations, if applicants, or, or I should say patentees, um, were uh, believed that their patents were being infringed, a lot of them didn't even pursue infringement for fear of exposing their own patents to further review. So all of these things sort of have contributed to uh, almost a, a, a feeling of stifling. Okay, at this moment, I'm going to give you CLE code number one, and the term is nanotech. All right, so we know this patent thicket exists. Let's talk about some uh, ways to navigate the patent thicket in order to maximize your IP. The good news is that there are solutions for dealing with this thicket, and they exist at both the front end uh, before you get your patent, as well as the back end once patents are issued. At the front end, um, the focus can really be on patent drafting strategies. And a lot of these strategies are just good patent drafting strategies in general. Some are more specific to the issues that have led to the patent thicket. But for example, um, you want to be able to draft your applications to avoid written description rejections. And a few things that you can do to sort of avoid the problems that led to the thicket in the first place are um, begin with using well-known terms of art. The science has certainly evolved at this point. Uh, there are terms of art that are being used consistently. I use those terms of art in order to avoid the ambiguity of inconsistent terminology. Also, uh, a lot of times uh, applicants want to define their invention by uh, characterization techniques that they used. Uh, for example, scanning electron microscopy, x-ray diffraction, whatever those are, always make sure that you properly define those techniques. Uh, initially, a lot of the patents that were being issued were pretty broad. And so one of the things you can do now is, is make sure that you not only have a set of broad claims, but narrow claims as well. Uh, and this can help in giving a variety uh, in the scope of your protection as well as um, setting up your licensing positions. Other things to note is that you want to emphasize the elements or the solution to a new problem that your invention is um, addressing. You don't really want to focus on size, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, you want to emphasize the interdisciplinary aspect of the invention. So focus on specific industries and fields of use. Um, these can help provide a little bit of context to uh, the examiner as well when they're examining. And also, if you have um, come across relevant art, it's good to submit that art at the beginning of prosecution. Again, this can help sort of steer the examiners in the right direction. Patentability issues that can arise. Um, for nanotech inventions are pretty much the same things for, for everything else. 
Uh, 101 patentable subject matter is, um, believe it or not, an issue as well that needs to be taken into consideration for nanotech inventions. A lot of nanomaterials exist in nature. Carbon-based nanoparticles are made by candle flames, graphene by pencil. Uh, so it's important to evaluate your technology for any potential 101 issues and whether or not they could fall within the laws of nature uh, definition. To date, there really aren't any apparent challenges to nanotech patents under the Supreme Court's expanded patentable subject matter exceptions, but that could change and it's something that everybody should keep an eye on. Uh, 102 and 103 issues can arise in co the context of inheresy. Inherency. Uh, remember, a lot of these technologies already existed on the micro scale, so uh, the mere size change can potentially be considered inherently anticipatory. To avoid that, you want to show that the, these size changes actually confer some kind of novel property to the invention. All right, so those are strategies for dealing with the thicket up front. What about on the back end when you actually have um, patents? There's a variety of tools that are available. Um, again, these are very standard um, tools that you can use. Licensing strategies, including cross-licensing patent pools. Uh, the various re-examination procedures available at the USPTO, including ex-party proceedings and inter-parties review. And of course, infringement litigation. Licensing is um, a traditional tool that's always used and it, it's no different for nanotech. Um, these can be exclusive or non-exclusive. Um, in the case of nanotech, cross-licensing is something that has been used where you um, licenses are issued between parties and it's usually parties that have some sort of uh, symmetrical relationship. So for example, A needs a license to B's patent just as badly as B needs a license to A's patent. And, and these cross licenses tend to work very well uh, when you have a limited number of firms that are all producing similar products. Uh, of course, you can always include indemnification provisions, promises not to sue. Uh, patent pools are, are an interesting uh, licensing technique for um, navigating the, na the nano uh, tech patent thicket, and this is simply because these pools will allow you to collect all the overlapping patent rights into a single agreement. So in many situations, you can put all the building block patents and all the downstream patents that came from it together and provide just one comprehensive uh, packet of patents that are all complementary to each other, uh, all in a single licensing agreement um, to a party. And a, the advantage of this is you can re greatly reduce the transaction costs that are associated with obtaining individual licenses to these patents. So patent pools um, are an option that can be used to navigate the patent thicket. Of course, you can restrict these licenses even further um, to specific fields or uses of territory uh, and make them a little bit more specific than just a general license. Options available at the USPTO um, are, are uh, uh, another tool that you can use to deal with existing patents and navigating that thicket. Um, Ex-party proceedings is our uh, third-party option. Third-party presents prior art uh, to the office. And essentially, this is a new examination. Um, this, this type of um, proceeding is pretty good to deal with some of the broad patents that came about early on in the patent land grab. You just have to keep in mind that many times the applicants can walk away with an amended set of claims or they can even add claims. And so you might think you're knocking a patent out, but you might just end up having the um, patentee narrow their claims a little bit. Interparties review or IPR um, is a fairly new proceeding at the USPTO. Uh, I like to call this a mini litigation. Here the requester remains a party to the dispute and within a finite amount of time you can address uh, patentability under 102 and 103 and could potentially walk away with invalidating a patent in a very short period of time uh, and a, probably a fraction of the cost of, of some litigations. 
What about nanotech infringement litigation? Well, like I said in the beginning, um, just the existence of the patent thicket has sort of kept the amount of nanotech infringement litigation at a minimal. So there's, there's not a lot of data on nanotech infringement litigation. But the litigation that's out there, if you look at the issues that are being addressed, many of them are just run-of-the-mill issues, claim construction disputes, uh, royalty or licensing disputes. Because there's minimal data out there and a lot of these cases end up going to settlement, it's very difficult to determine whether or not any of the litigation um, deals with issues that are directly related to the patent thicket. All right, so some final thoughts. Um, just need to know that despite the existence of of this patent thicket, uh, the issues that are associated with it are not insurmountable. Um, many of the issues that were involved in the formation of the thicket have now either been addressed or can be addressed. Remember, the USPTO has implemented a bunch of changes to um, provide better quality examination. There's also the strategic drafting uh, that can be done at the front end. All of these can help build a robust patent portfolio, and also uh, tools on the back end for existing patents. Uh, again, you have uh, procedures at the USPTO. Uh, you can have licensing options as well as outright litigation. And, and these are also tools that can be used to manage the patent thicket. All right, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Mark Jenkins. All right, thanks, Aisha. My name is Mark Jenkins. I am counsel, and I'm also located here in the Research Triangle Park office of Brings Gilson and Leanne. So today I'm going to really talk about three uh, cases that are going to be heard by the Supreme Court in 2017. Uh, these cases are, are necessarily directed at nanotechnology, but can encompass not only nanotechnology companies, but chemical companies and a wide variety of companies in various technologies. So the first case we're going to talk about is Life Technology Corporation versus Promega. And at issue in this case is whether a cause of action for patent infringement exists based on the export of components of a patent invention that are to be combined outside the United States. So the key statute at issue in this case is the interpretation of 35 U.S.C. 271 F1, which basically says that infringement can be found when a, quote, substantial portion of a patent and invention is supplied from the U.S. and then combined outside the United States to create, some, create something that would infringe as if it was assembled inside the United States. So how did this case get started? Well, in terms of background, Life Tech itself manufactures genetic testing kits that provide components for doing what's called multiplex amplification of DNA samples. Now, each one of these kits has five components. One of these components is called TAC polymerase, and this is an enzyme. Life Tech manufactures this TAC polymerase inside the United States. Life Tech then ships this enzyme to a manufacturing facility in the United Kingdom where it's assembled and these kits are uh, distributed worldwide and they're sold to law enforcement agencies for forensic identification purposes as well as to clinical and research institutions. In 2006, Life Tech was granted a non-exclusive license to use inventions described in four of Promega's patents, as well as a fifth patent directed to forensic and human identity applications. In 2010, Promega sued Life Tech, alleging that Life Tech infringed uh, the five pat patents by actually selling testing kits that were not covered by the original license in 2006. Life Tech responded and said that, hey, we actually are licensed to these patents, and even if not, uh, we're, we believe these patents are invalid on grounds of lack of enablement and obviousness. So at the district court, uh, the district court held that 271F1 actually does require the presence of a third party who is being induced. So a company cannot induce itself. 
the district court also held that 271F1 does not apply to cases where there's a single component that is supplied from the United States and exported outside the United States to be combined. Well, Promega appealed to the Federal Circuit. So what happened at the Federal Circuit? Well, the Federal Circuit ultimately concluded that LifeTech itself was liable for infringement of at least the fifth patent that was directed to forensic and human identity applications under 271A as well as 271F1. And with regard specifically to 271F1, the Federal Circuit noted that to actively induce a combination, the involvement of a third party is actually not required. So they went in the opposite direction of the district court in this case. They also noted that export of a single component is sufficient to attach liability under 271F1. So under these specific facts, the kit component that um, LifeTech made in the U.S., which was the TAC polymerase, was considered a substantial portion of the component's testing kit because without the TAC polymerase, the entire kit was inoperable. So LifeTech filed a petition for writ of certiorari and LifeTech argued that the Federal cir Circuit should not have interpreted the term, quote, substantial portion in a qualitative sense. Instead, they believe the Federal Circuit should have adopted a quantitative uh, sort of analysis for this phrase. In this regard, LifeTech argued that by equating, quote, substantial portion of the, of the components, end quote, to an important or essential component, the Federal Circuit made 271F1 so broad that this phrase was all but meaningless. So what is the real issue before the Supreme Court? Well, it comes down to a single issue, and that is whether the Federal Circuit erred in holding that by supplying a single commodity component of a multi-component invention from the U.S. is an infringing act. So under these facts, again, the issue will be whether the export of the TAC polymerase was sufficient to be considered a substantial portion of the components under the statute. So what are some of the implications? Well, first we need to note that the Federal Circuit's ruling that 271F1 does not require an entity or a third party to actively induce, this particular holding is not subject to the Supreme Court review. So manufacturers who manufacture components for assembly abroad should take note of this and note that they cannot avoid infringement just because the assembly is being performed by the same entity rather than by a third party. So some argued that if the Federal Circuit is upheld, this may interfere with global logistics. It can burden U.S. manufacturers, especially those with global operations. So in this regard, some argued that if the Federal Circuit takes uh, this position of the Federal Circuit takes away any incentives for multinational companies to supply components from the United States to their same uh, subsidiaries outside the United States. Now on the flip side, there's the argument that reversal would actually encourage U.S. manufacturing and exports, with the companies in the U.S. only needing to take caution when they are shipping, quote, a substantial portion of the components and not just a single component. And now we have arrived at CLE code number two, and the term is patent thicket. And with that, we'll move into the second case we're going to talk about, which is Impression Products versus Lexmark International. In this case, we hope we'll address any tension that exists between the doctrine of patent exhaustion and the right to restrict sales after an initial sale. So let's step back for a second and remind ourselves, what exactly is patent exhaustion? Well, under the doctrine of patent exhaustion, a patentee's right to restrict the sale of a product is exhausted with a first authorized sale. So in other words, resale is not infringement. So what is the Supreme Court's current position on patent exhaustion? And to get there, we don't have to go too far back. We only need to go to 2008 in the Quanta versus LG electronics case. And some quick points about this case, LG licensed certain patents to Intel. The license contained a limitation that no license was granted to any third party to combine the licensed products with components from any other source. Well, Quanta comes along, 
combines the Intel products with non-Intel components, and they make computers that ultimately practice the LG patents. LG sues Quanta for patent infringement, and the case makes its way before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ultimately holds that the authorized sale of an article that substantially embodies a patent exhausts a patent holder's rights and prevents the patent holder from invoking patent law-based control post-sale use of an article. So in terms of the, the, the instant case, how did this case get started? Well, I think we all probably recognize Le Lexmark. Lexmark is one of the leading producers of laser printage, printers and, and toner cartridges. Uh, Lexmark at the time of this case offered cartridges under two different programs. One was what was referred to as the regular cartridge program, and this is where cartridges were sold at full price without any sort of restrictions on reuse or resale. The second program was what was termed the return program cartridge program, and this is where cartridges were sold at a 20% discount, but there was, they were subject to a no resale and no reuse restriction. So in this case, Impression had acquired some expended Lexmark cartridges. They refilled them. They resold them. The cartridges that they had acquired were actually included in the restricted return program, and Impression did have notice of these restrictions. So Lexmark sued Impression for patent infringement, and they alleged that Impression's importation of foreign sold cartridges constituted infringement. And the district court in this case ultimately held that the resale of cartridges originally sold in the United States was permissible, and that is despite any sort of no reuse or resale restrictions. Now on the flip side, with regard to the cartridges sold abroad, the district court agreed with Lexmark on this point and held that foreign sales do not exhaust U.S. patent rights. So Lexmark actually appealed this case to the Federal Circuit. And at the Federal Circuit, um, they held that the sale of an article under clearly communicated and lawful post-sale restrictions on reuse and resale avoids patent exhaustion. So this actually preserves patent rights against downstream buyers who have knowledge of these restrictions. The Federal Circuit also held that a patentee's or licensee's overseas sales of a patented article do not exhaust U.S. patent rights in the article that is sold, even if no reservation accompanies these sales. So Impression filed a petition for writ of certiorari, and Impression argued that if the Federal Circuit is upheld, the patent exhaustion doctrine is going to be meaningless, meaning uh, because a patent, patentee can avoid the doctrine entirely by simply putting restriction on the first sale. Um, Impression also argued that the Federal Circuit holding enables a patentee to disrupt international commerce by extracting multiple payments from multiple points downstream. Well, Lexmark didn't take too kindly to this. They said we should stick with the status quo, essentially, and to quote their petition or their, or their brief, they say uh, com commerce is not ground to a halt and there's no reason to think it will suddenly do so now. So what are the key issues that the Supreme Court has to decide in this case. Well, first, the Supreme Court has to decide whether a conditional sale avoids patent, ex patent exhaustion and permits post-sale restrictions. Secondly, the Supreme Court will address whether the sale of a patented item outside the U.S. exhausts the patent owner's rights to later sue for infringement. So what are some of the implications on either side of this, this case? Well, with an what could be considered a win by impression, patent owners may have a growing concern over how they can obtain full and fair value for their intellectual property, either through contracting or licensing. So in this regard, we may see parties starting to look to renegotiate licensing arrangements. And also from the impression side of things, it's interesting to note that the uh, uh, Solicitor General of the United States is actually backing the impression position. And in, in the brief they filed, it says, the Federal Circuit's decision misreads precedent and would substantially erode the exhaustion doctrine. Now, on the flip side, what about if Lexmark's position is adopted? Well, there's the argument that patent owners may actually be more flexible in licensing arrangements since they know payments can be extracted from multiple points downstream. 
So as you can see, this is an important case for, for all companies in various technologies, including chemical and nanotech, especially those that sell products that are covered by a U.S. patent and could impact also patentees pricing uh, and licensing stra uh, strategy structure moving forward. And the last case we're going to talk about is the TC Heartland versus Kraft Food, uh, excuse me, Kraft Food Brands Group Brands LLC case. And this case centers around restrictions on where patent lawsuits can be filed. So how did this case get started? Well, Kraft sued the liquid sweetener company known as TC Heartland in Delaware, alleging that Heartland's products infringe at least three of Kraft's patents. TC Heartland itself is actually incorporated and headquartered in the state of Indiana. TC Heartland requested that the case be moved back to Indiana where they are located. And in, in doing so, they reasoned that uh, Delaware is not the, pra the practical place for venue because we aren't registered to do business in Delaware. There is no local presence in Delaware. There's no supply contracts in Delaware and we haven't called on any accounts in the state of Delaware. Well, the district court actually disagreed and they noted that TC Heartland had actually shipped orders of these accused products into the state of Delaware and so they were subject to the jurisdiction of Delaware. So let's step back and take a quick review of some of the relevant holdings and statutes that cover venue. So We'll go back to 1957 first to the, the Supreme Court decision in Forco Glass versus Transmira Products. And in this case, the Supreme Court held that the patent venue statute, which is 28 U.S.C. 1400B, is actually the sole and exclusive provision controlling patent venue. And the only proper venue for patentees to file is actually in the corporate defendant state of incorporation. Well, fast forward to 1988. The general statute then was actually amended to recite that a defendant corporation is deemed to reside in any judicial district in which the corporation is subject to personal jurisdiction. So in 1990, we actually get an interpretation from the Federal Circuit in what's known as the VE holding case. And in this case, the Federal Circuit held that patent suits could be filed in any district where the court had personal jurisdiction over defendant. For instance, where a defendant makes sales. So now, fast forward again, 2011, Congress makes uh, some amendments to the general venue statute. And one of these amendments was to include the introductory phrase, quote, applicability of this section, and then the, pat and then the uh, actual statute is recited. And then the, this phrase was included so that the general venue statute would apply, quote, except as otherwise provided by law. Well, T.C. Heartland, in view of these amendments, filed a writ of mandamus to the Federal Circuit and argued that, hey, the V holding decision has, has, has over, was overruled by the 2011 amendments and that under the general venue statute, patent suits can only be filed where the defendant is either incorporated or has established place of business and has infringed. So the Federal Circuit actually denied this writ and said, hey, these amendments are minor and these do not support your position, T.C. Heartland. So T.C. Heartland filed a uh, certiorari petition in the September of 2016 and this was actually granted by the Supreme Court just this past December. So what are the issues that the Supreme Court will address in this case? Well, the question that the Supreme Court will answer hopefully is whether the patent venue statute is the sole and exclusive provision governing venue and patent infringement actions and whether this statute can be supplemented by the general venue statute. So currently, the patent venue statute allows cases to be filed where the defendant resides or where the defendant has committed acts of infringement and has a regular and established pace of business. So what are some of the potential implications of the Supreme Court decision? Well, with the T.C. Heartland, quote, win, a decision restricting venue in the way T.C. Heartland has requested would undoubtedly reduce the number of suits that we see in the Eastern District of Texas. And that's because very few defendants are actually located in the Eastern District of Texas. 
It is interesting to note that in 2016, approximately 40% of all patent cases were filed in the Eastern District of Texas. Also, technology companies are hoping that there is a decision that actually restricts non-practicing entities from forum shopping and choosing what are or at least perceived to be plaintiff-friendly venues. And finally, uh, adopting a residential or quote, place of incorporation rule could cause plaintiffs who are going to file against multiple defendants to have to file in multiple districts. And this arguably will increase costs and could stretch the resources of plaintiffs. Now on the flip side, uh, in the event of a craft quote win, I believe we will probably see a call for a legislative venue reform act in Congress and some actions to be taken to disrupt what is believed to be the status quo of forum shopping. And with that we come to our, not only the conclusion of my section, but also the final CLE code, which is chemicals. And we can also now address questions that have come in. And uh, one question that, that came through that actually pertained to me, so I'll address that. And the question was, well, what district courts other than the Eastern District of Texas could see a major change in filed cases if the Supreme Court restricts venue as suggested by T.C. Heartland? And um, in my view, I think the Northern District of Illinois potentially could see a slowdown. I think we will undoubtedly see a major uptick in, in places like the District Court of Delaware because Delaware is so popular for places uh, for businesses to incorporate. And, and in, along that same reasoning, I think you could see an uptick in places even as obscure as Nevada or Wyoming because Nevada and Wyoming are also viewed as pro-business incorporation states. All right, so another question that came in and looks like it's directed to me is how does the National Nanotech Initiative aid in maximizing the return of investment? Uh, so the NNI has several endeavors that aim toward getting a greater return uh, in investment, either by public entities such as universities or by private entities, corporations, uh, small and large. Uh, so there are a number of research and development centers throughout the United States uh, that the NNI has helped develop the infrastructure for. Uh, these research and development centers allow uh, participants to make use of top-notch uh, materials, top-notch uh, equipment uh, in order to further uh, their research. Uh, so. There are many. There are so many to list. Uh, it would hard. It would be difficult to go through them um, in this short time. However, uh, there is a website. It is the it's www.nano.gov, uh, and there provided there is provided a list of the different uh, research centers uh, that are placed in different areas in the United States. Uh, in addition, uh, there are a number of technology transfer centers uh, that the NNI supports. Uh, one in particular is the Robert C. Byrd National Technology Transfer Center. Um, another transfer center is the Federal Laboratory Consortium uh, for Technology Transfer. Uh, that is a national network of laboratories uh, that provide a forum to develop strategies and opportunities for commercialization. Uh, and lastly, uh, th there is also the Small Business Initiative Partnerships Program, uh, which works hand in hand with the Robert C. Byrd uh, National Technology Transfer Center. And this provides some opportunities for small business small businesses uh, to get understanding um, tech transfer as well as uh, helps them provide, it provides them resources uh, with regard to licensing, with regard to intellectual property uh, so that small businesses are not at a disservice uh, when utilizing some of these resources. Um, and lastly, there are private and pu public partnerships. Uh, one in particular is the Na National Cancer Institute uh, has partnered with the NNI uh, so that research on preventing cancer uh, and curing cancer 
uh, with regard to nanotechnology. Uh, there is an effort there, and the NNI supports that as well. So there are a number of ways that the NNI is aiding uh, with returning uh, the with maximizing the return on investment. Uh, and, and it's worthwhile for people to take a look at the website and take a look at the strategic plan and, and understand the efforts there uh, with regard to pushing uh, nanotechnology forward. I think there's uh, time for one more question. Um, and it looks like there's a question for, for me. Um, the question is, because of the patent land grab, who are the biggest stakeholders that own these building block patents? Well, um, like I said in my presentation, a lot of the earliest players um, in nanotech were universities. Um, there were some small companies, um, but the bulk of the er earliest innovation happened at universities. So at this point, um, it's probably the universities that own uh, the largest percentage of IP directed to these um, building block patents. Now, how easy or how hard is it to, for them uh, to license these out? Uh, remember, a lot of these universities have tech transfer offices that are um, available to go ahead and get the IP, but they don't necessarily have the means to commercialize their IP. Uh, many universities are um, uh, banking on the income that licensing their IP can provide. So I would think that's an incentive for universities to go ahead and, and license this IP out. Uh, how, how much of the building block patents um, can be attributed to the universities, I don't know. Um, but I do think that the, um, the biggest share of ownership that exists out there probably does belong to these universities. All right, so there's one more question. I think we can get it in really quickly. Um, and it's one that was directed to me again. Uh, are there other countries that have similar uh, nanotechnology initiatives? And there are other countries. Uh, one, there are other countries that have initiatives directed to nanotechnology. Um, in particular, the European Commission of the European Union, uh, there is a similar effort there uh, to make the same strides that are happening here in the United States. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, there are com is a community of research uh, between the European Union and the United States uh, to engage in the sharing of this information and uh, also with licensing and things of that nature. So that there are push, there is a push uh, in different countries to find more advances in nanotechnology. Uh, according to a, a research estimate uh, that was done uh, with the NNI, uh, the United States ha has invested, uh, has provided the most funding, government funding. Uh, it's hard to get a read on how much countries are spending individually. Uh, even though countries may have these initiatives, the government may not provide any funding toward the initiatives. And so while they support the initiative, they're not supporting them financially. So it's a bit difficult to figure out if the United States compared to other countries with these initiatives where we fall in that in there or comparing other countries together. Uh, but ultimately, uh, there are these different initiatives. There are different organizations focusing on pushing nanotechnology forward. Uh, so the NNI is, is very much in line and actually a leader in trying to coordinate all of these efforts. Uh, and hopefully, it will continue on. Uh, so. Not seeing any more questions, and I believe we're out of time anyway, uh, we would like to thank you for attending uh, our presentation. Uh, if there are any questions in regard to the material that was presented today, please feel free to contact any one of the presenters uh, or any attorneys here at Brinks, Gilson, and Leon. Again, we thank you for your attendance.